is what comes of doing a festival in Wigtown. <laughs> thank you all so much for coming and thank you, Roz. Thank you, Roz, for the introduction. Uh, there will be no spoilers in this and it will be a chance to look over the whole of Ian's career. Uh -oh. It's quite remarkable. <laughs> It's quite remarkable that they've been going so long and have been so consistently inventive. You will be able to solve who does this. And I think there is something very good about the kind of crime novel where you aren't given some huge revelation about a twin or a trapdoor in the last few pages. And it also has some very profound and important things to say about rehabilitation and imprisonment. As some of you will know, so this isn't a spoiler, at the end of the last novel, Rebus found himself in prison. And so it kicks off from there. It's also, I should add, as well as having a plot set in Edinburgh with the police like Siobhan, there is a crime inside the prison. So it is a classic locked room mystery. Why did you want to write a locked room mystery? Um, I'm not sure I did want to write a locked room mystery, but um, as you have suggested, the last book ended with Rebus. Actually, the last book didn't end up with Rebus getting sent to jail. The last book ended up with Sentenced. Rebus at the Reichenbach yeah. Falls. Sentence is about to be pronounced, and we've got no idea what that sentence is going to be. And I thought, what a great ending to the series. But fans disagreed. <laughs> they said, we really need to know what happens next. What, what, was the, what sentence was pronounced in that courtroom? So I thought about it. I thought, well, oh, he's found guilty. Okay, if he's found guilty, he's going to go to jail. Oh, interesting. I've got, I've got an ex-detective in jail surrounded by people who hate him because he's an ex-detective. And some of those people are people he's put in there who will wish ill of him. Um, so I thought, okay, what am I going to do with Rebus in prison? Oh, well, he's going to solve a murder, um, obviously. Okay, so someone's murdered. Where are they murdered? Well, in a jail cell. Ah, what if the jail cell is locked and there's no murder weapon? So the body is found, but there's no weapon. I thought, this is getting interesting now. I mean, A, because I, I do like that sub-genre of crime fiction where you have uh -huh. the locked room mystery. I mean, Edgar Allan, po Edgar Allan Poe probably did the first one with Murders on the Rue Morgue. And John Dixon um, Carr did that yeah, thing yeah, where all whole... the crime writers had a different version of it. Yeah, it's exactly. It's a super book. Um, I, I, so I thought that, okay, this is, this is sounding good. Um, and you've got, you know, every every prisoner thinks it must have been a, a prison officer. Every prison officer thinks it must have been a prisoner. So there's a lot of tension in the jail um, and the place might erupt uh, if Rebus doesn't solve the crime. So, so he's trying to solve a crime while surrounded by people who want him dead, basically. I just thought, this is a winner. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll write it and in the process of writing it, I'll try and work out who the killer is and how they managed to get away with it. <laughs> and that I didn't know when I started. T tell me about the research for it though. Uh, it's always HMP Edinburgh in the book and not Softon, but how did you find going into places like Softon? I find it quite chilling when I did research for my non-fiction book. Uh, I, I, I've been in, I've been in uh, quite a few prisons in the course of my career, um, <laughs> always leaving them at the end of the day. Uh, I mean, I've done events at Schott's Jail, I've been to Barlini for a visit, um, I've been to Sochten before, um, I've been to Perth Prison to talk to the prisoners about literacy, writing classes, and also Wandsworth Jail in London, again, to give a talk to the prisoners. So, you know, I thought, okay, I've, I've, I can't even know, but I need to know more. Um, so, uh, there's a well-known photographer in Edinburgh um, called David Eustace. Yeah. And David Eustace used to be a prison officer at Bar Linney. He got interested in photography when he was a prison officer. Um, and I said, David, uh, do you know anybody? <laughs> and he knew people who knew people who knew people. And eventually I was put in touch with the governor at HMP Edinburgh. And uh, this is where it got, I got lucky. I got lucky because the governor was on the cusp of retiring. And so he was actually very open <laughs> to answering questions and giving me a wee bit of gossip and a wee bit of inside stuff that might not otherwise have been the case. He wasn't as guarded as might otherwise have been the case. And so it was terrific. So I got to go to Sochton and I got to go into the cells and see what the cells were like. And um, I, I got to talk to guards, I got to talk to prisoners, I got to talk to ancillary staff. You know, the library is run by the City of Edinburgh Council. 
the nurses are provided by the NHS, the education that the prisoners get is all under the aegis of uh, Fife College. Fife College has a contract for all the prisons in Scotland to provide education. So I got all of that, and that was just terrific. Um, but just to tell you one wee, this isn't really a spoiler, but it's one of my favorite bits in the book. I then wrote the book and gave it to my publisher, and they said, well, um, yeah, it's great. I said, but you, could you just suggest a wee bit more detail of what they wear? We don't get a real sense of what they're wearing when they're in prison. The colour coordination. And, and I, I said, well, I can't really remember. I'll, I'll, and so I got back in touch with the governor. And he said, well, the, yeah, the, the, in the, this, as long as they're on their own wing, they're not called wings, they're called halls in Scotland. As long as they're in their own hall, um, they can wear what they like. But if they're leaving their hall to go to other parts of the prison or to leave the prison for whatever reason, they're, they wear colours so that we know what kind of prisoner we're dealing with. And you don't get a situation where a bunch of sex offenders are passing a bunch of lifers in what's called free flow, um, the, the main sort of corridors of the prison. And I said, what was the colour coordination? And there was about six different colours. But the ones that I flagged up straight away were, he said, the lifers, the kind of serious, the serious hardcore crim, criminals, wear green. Uh, and the sex offenders wear maroon. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about this for a, a good 30 seconds. So it was Galen Hoyk, I take it. I, well, I thought, I, I, really? I mean, this is soft, and this is where Hart and Lothian play their matches. You know, the, the ground is like 100 yards along the road. Uh, who came up with that? And it turns out it was a previous governor who was a Hibernian football fan. <laughs> <laughs> but I went back to the jail last week, as I said, to talk to the prisoners, and I was actually talking to one of the, the guards, one of the prison officers, about that, about the colour coordination. We were waiting to see who was going to be coming in to the room for my talk, uh, were there going to be any maroon talks coming in. Um, uh, anyway, and we're talking about it. He said, yeah, he said, but you know, it's different in every jail in Scotland. The, color, the colours are different. It's up to the governor to decide. Uh, he said, if you go to Perth jail, it's exactly the opposite, because the governor at Perth jail was a Hearts fan. <laughs> <laughs> so the lifers wear maroon, and the sex offenders wear green. The thing about a prison, and it... It's almost counterintuitive, is that the prison is the ultimate grey area, morally speaking. Rebus has always been a character who both likes rules and likes structures because he knows then how to bend them and twist them. Can you talk a bit about that tension in Rebus of being the guy who knows the rules sufficiently to break the rules and how that works in a prison? I, I, I don't think he likes structure. I think he knows he needs structure. Slightly different thing. Interesting to stick. His, his, his life has always needed some structure in it. He's always worked basically in big organisations that require him to follow orders. So the, the army, he left school, joined the army. And in the army he did SAS training. And he sort of flunked that um, quite spectacularly in the first book. Um, but then he moved into the police, which again has a hierarchy and has rules and regulations. Um, and then he starts to twist them as far as he can and stretch them and jump over the line, cross the line as much as he can before he steps back again. Prison suits him pretty well because prison does have routine and Rebus's life is all about routine. And pr in prison, he's in a little cell and that's pretty much what he would be doing anyway. He would be in his living room um, in, his, in his flat in Edinburgh with some music and some books uh, and that's his life, you know. So he fits in fairly well. I, I mean, here's where the book is not as accurate or as, as factual as it could be. I mean, prison overcrowding, he might well be sharing a cell, but he wouldn't be in the general population anyway. Yeah. In fact, the governor said to me, he said, look, an Edinburgh cop would not be sent here. I said, well, where would you be sent? He said, Dumfries or Inverness. I went, I, oh, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I do not want to set a book in Dumfries or Inverness. <laughs> I want to set a book in Edinburgh. He said, well, he'd be in the, he'd be in the kind of isolation wing where they have the kind of prisoners who cannot be allowed into the general population, which is a much smaller area uh, with small cells and a little, it's got its own little recreation area. Um, and he said that's where he would probably be kept. So that's where, when we start the book, that's where he's been until he's allowed out into the general population where I needed him to be, but in real life he probably wouldn't be. And when he is in that general uh, population of the of the prison, it's never quite certain if he's working for the governor or working for uh, 
the, well, McCafferty's uh, replacement, mm. Peter McCafferty's replacement. So again, there's that tension between which side is he on? Is this you know, the, the, the good rebus doing the work of the governor or is it the sort of rebus who's willing to cut a deal with the devil? Yeah, I mean, hopefully from page one, I show you the hierarchy at work because he's yeah. standing in a queue waiting for breakfast and at the front of the queue are the head cases, you know, who if you were in front of them would, would you know, have a go at you. So it's like, you know, the kind of people like uh, um, uh, Daryl Christie, the gangst young gangster, he's at the head of the queue, gets fed first and everything else, probably gets bigger portions than everybody else. Uh, and then there's, you know, old lifers who've been around, old lags, people look at, the guys look out for them a wee bit, so they're quite high up the queue, and then Rebus is further back. Um, so you start to get a sense of the hierarchy. And they're policing themselves. The prisoners yeah. are policing themselves. It's not the officer saying, line up in such an order. It's, the, it's a kind of unspoken arrangement that just keeps everything orderly. And in a prison, you need that. You need, you need everybody to be um, civilized. Otherwise, it all falls apart very quickly. Uh -huh. um, and the, the guards understand that. The prison officers understand that. Um, I've got to be very careful. I want to call them screws, and they're never called screws. I was asked by some prison officers, please don't call us screws. They said, the people in here don't call us screws. It's like a m misnomer. It's like people think that's what or a kind of slang term, a pejorative term for us, but it didn't ever used. Um, whether they were telling the truth or not, I don't know. But I don't use it. Um, and in the same way, the guards, they, they're called prison officers. They're not really called guards. There's a lot of stuff like that that I've tried to get right in the book so that I don't upset too many prison officers. I did this, the reason I went and gave a talk in Sockton last week and not after publication was I thought, once people have read this book, they might not be as happy for me to come back into the prison. <laughs> um, and that goes for the prison officers and the, uh, and the convicts. But one thing I found fascinating, and it chimed with something I learned when I went to Barlini to ask about certain things in the, in the prison, um, is that there's a, an understanding that this is not actually about curing or getting rid of criminality, particularly with things like drugs. It's about managing criminality. Uh, the governor of Barlini was saying they had quite a high profile prisoner there at the time and one of the elderly prisoners said could you please stop this prisoner's wife acting up because we can't get our drugs in. To which the, you know, the governor said that's my nightmare. Yeah. You know, if they're all going cold turkey we've got a real problem. So can you talk a bit about that sense that they have to find some common ground, some mm -hmm. space between the offender and the judiciary where they can negotiate and you know, have some kind of normal functioning. Sure. Well, I mean, for a long time, you know, if, if, if you saw anybody, any governor from a Scottish prison in the press, they were always saying there's no drugs in Scottish jails. They kept that pretense up for decades. Yeah. Um, but drugs have always been there. And, they, and uh, you know, more and more ingenious ways are found to get drugs into jails. Um, I mean, it used to be over soft and it was just a catapult. And you just went to the wall and you just launched a catapult, you just launched the drugs over, and nine times out of ten, the officers picked them up, but one time in ten, it might be a prisoner who picked them up. Um, now they've gone a bit more kind of... And the inhaler. It's quite nice, oh, that yeah. touch with Rebus well, and the inhaler. Rebus, I mean, this is often a tangent slightly, but Rebus has COPD. Um, I gave him that a few books ago. I just thought, that's great. It's got the word cop in it. Um, <laughs> so because he's got COPD, he has to have an inhaler, a puffer. Um, so when I was talking to the NHS nurses uh, in, in Sochton, um, I said to them, you know, so Rebus would come to you to get his inhaler and that regularly and all that. And they went, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, that's right. But he'd have to be careful because the prisoners would try and steal it from him. And I went, why? They went to turn them into um, bongs. <laughs> They'll use them to smoke drugs. And I went, really? Anyway, that's, that made it into the book. All these wee details made it into the book. Um, the, what you were saying, I mean, the thing about the, 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 the yeah, I mean, if, yeah. The drugs is an interesting one because there are staffing issues in all prisons. We know this. In the whole of the UK, there are staffing issues. If you've got staff issues, if you've got problems, the prisoners tend to be locked up for longer. If you've got financial problems, it means you've not got as much education so that, again, they're not getting to go out of their cells and go to other wings and do stuff. So they tend to spend longer in their cells. So they're going to go off their nut and drugs help them to get through that. So, and, and so it's just like a way of dealing with this. You've also got people in jail who shouldn't be in jail. They should be in some kind of psychiatric care unit, but there's no places for them 
or they've not yet been properly diagnosed. And I, again, I flag that up in the book, yeah. Um, yeah. that there are people in here who shouldn't be in here. And so the, the, the entirety of the Rebus series has been me almost having an intellectual argument with Rebus about the way the world is in different ways. He's a very much an Old Testament guy. He's always seen the world in terms of absolutes, good and evil. Once you're a baddie, you're always a baddie. His job is to put you away and keep you away. Um, rehabilitation for him is a very great area. Um, put him in jail and actually have him live with these people, um, he starts to change his mind. Or I start to change his mind because I'm introducing him to this, these concepts. Yeah. Um, and so I think, hopefully, Stuart, it's a very even-handed, it's not a sensationalist book. Yeah. I mean, yes, there's a murder in it, but it's not a sensationalist book in the way that I present prison life. When I was at Wigtown and cheering another author, one thing we were discussing was how it's possible to have a moral book which is non-judgmental. And I think you do that exceptionally well in all the series, but particularly in this one. Can we move slightly on to Siobhan's plot in it? Because it's about a, a, a young schoolgirl going missing. And I don't want to talk about too much of what transpires in that. But you go to some pretty dark places, perhaps darker than in some of the previous Rebus novels. And I just wonder if that's a sort of comment on how long the series has been running, that the crimes are changing and in fact becoming in some ways less detectable and more insidious mm. and more corrosive of our society. Um, yeah, how do you talk about it without giving spoilers? Um, yeah, I mean, Siobhan, the whole book was going to be set in prison. That when I got the idea for the story, it was just Rebus' story. And I thought, I mean, I really want, I really want there to be some connective tissue with the outside world. Um, and then I thought it's also going to be a very, very, very short book. So I thought I need a plot on the outside. And um, as always, I mean, I, I clip things from articles from newspapers and stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, teenage runaways. I mean, young people go missing. We know that. And mostly, thank God, they turn up safe at some point in the future. But sometimes they don't. But when, when a young person disappears, it shakes up society, it shakes up yeah. the community, it shakes up the, the city or the neighbourhood, and it shakes up the families involved. I thought that could be a really interesting thing to write about. Um, so that gave me something for Siobhan to do. And then her one-time sidekick, Christine Essen, um, is actually, because I said to the governor, okay, there's a murder in jail, who investigates? He went, just normal CID. They would come in from the outside, they'd be very controlled in the way they went about their investigation, but they would be in here interviewing people. Um, and collecting evidence and all that kind of stuff. So I thought, well, that's great. So that's what Christy Nesson is involved in. And um, uh, so, yeah, so Siobhan's working on this missing person case, uh, which does go to some pretty dark places and looks at technology and the role that technology... I mean, you know, criminals are always ahead of the curve. They're yes. way ahead of the forces of law and order when it comes to using technology. I mean, as soon as the internet was invented, porn was on there, right? We know this. Yeah. Bef before, before Noam Chomsky was on there giving lectures, porn was in there. Um, so whenever they find something they can do with technology, whether it's using uh, drones or whether it's using bell, uh, doorbell cameras or whatever it is, there's always going to be tech. Your phone spying on you. I, in fact, there's a whole kind of um, crime fiction at the moment seems to be driven by paranoia. It's driven by because yeah. crime novels, crime fiction has always dealt with the fears of its contemporary audience. And right now, our fears are a kind of paranoid thing that there's, a, there's conspiracies everywhere. We don't know who to trust. Our politicians are lying to us. The media uh, is, is skewed. We can't trust what we see on the TV. We can't trust what we read on the internet. Uh, fake news is everywhere. Would, you know, and when you can't trust, when you don't think you can trust anything, then you're open to all kinds of possibilities. People can just feed you almost anything. So. Um, that, so the crime fiction that's written at the moment is a lot of it is your, actually your spouse is not who you think they are. Yep. Your neighbours yep. are not who you think they are. Your kids, your parents are not who you think they are. Um, they're hiding something from you. There's some dark secret. Something's going on that you're not aware of. Um, and this maybe picks up a little bit on that, about the fact that, that um, very quickly, I've got a journalist in it, right, and she used to be employed by the Scotsman as a crime reporter. But then, they, <laughs> they, but then they sacked her like every other bugger on the Scotsman. Um, and so she set herself up as a kind of keyboard warrior 
and she's got a, a blog and everything else. But to, but to make money from the internet, she's got to sensationalise, and she's got to be first on the scene. Yeah. Uh, and all of that is talked about in this book to a large extent, the way the media controls the story or tries to control the story, and the way the police are sometimes acting with the media to try and make sure their narrative is foremost, and sometimes they're working against them. Um, so there's a lot going on for yeah. a short book. I mean, I remember quite a while ago you were talking about the mobile phone and the way it becomes such a sort of plot killer mm. that you, know, you, you lose quite a lot of jeopardy if everyone's able to just dial and say, look, I'm sorry, there's somebody yeah. following my car. I'm in the back but of you a, seem I'm to in the trunk of a car. I've been yeah. kidnapped. Yeah. That's a short but one. you seem to have twisted that slightly now that actually this whole idea of surveillance rather than surveillance yeah. is actually feeding into the crime. Have you sort of made a rapprochement with what technology offers the crime novel? Um, I, again, to go off at a slight tangent, there is a, there's a line that I like in my, in, in my new play, and it's Rebus at a dinner party, and somebody's saying to him, well, you know, the job's changed since your day, John. It all used to be human intelligence and contacts and snitches and sitting in pubs and listening to people telling you stuff, and now it's all surveillance, and it's this, that, and the other, and it's CCTV and using technology. And, he, and Rebus goes, I like it. I like tech, the use of technology because it helps us solve crimes where people thought they got away with it crimes that happened 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Suddenly the rise of technology, the rise of DNA analysis, um, crime scene analysis. Uh, you, can, you, know, you, can, you can get a result uh, in a way that you wouldn't have been able to get a result 10 or 20 years ago. I mean, things like the, um, uh, the murders of the two, the World's End murders, uh, I mean, with, was only finally solved because DNA, ma DNA matching had moved on so far that you could get DNA from a, a tightly rolled up pair of tights. Mm -hmm. um, and so somebody who thought they got away with murder or didn't, they were eventually captured because the evidence had been kept. Um, I mean, that's, that's the, the genius is actually keeping the evidence untainted so you can prove in court that this is not, been, this is not mm -hmm. fixed in any way. So all of that stuff, I think, is fascinating, absolutely fascinating. The problem for the crime writer is trying to keep, keep ahead of it or try to keep up with it because the technology is moving so quickly. And also people get a fake idea. You know, they see shows like CSI on TV and think, well, oh, yeah, police yeah, can yeah, do yeah. that. Yeah. You go, no, they really can't um, for all kinds of reasons, one of them being we've not got the budget. So in some of the books, somebody will say, oh, we could send this up to Germany for this new spectrograph analysis thing. You've not got the budget. You know, we'll just have to try and solve it the old-fashioned way. Malcolm Fox is back in this book. Um, what have you got against him? I know. <laughs> um, it, I've got nothing personally against Malcolm Fox. Um, except his except, character morals. <laughs> well, no, but you know when I, I mean, to go way back in time, I mean, I thought I'd done with Rebus. I thought Rebus was finished in exit music when he retired. And uh, my wife said, oh, this is great. You've got freedom now, Ian. You can write any kind of book you want to write. What do you want to write? I said, I want to write a police novel. <laughs> um, and I, but I didn't want people to think they were getting Rebus 2.0. So I thought, who could I, what kind of police character could I write about? And people wouldn't think it's just Rebus with a different name. I thought, well, the, the kind of cops who would investigate Rebus, internal affairs. So that's where Malcolm Fox arrived from. But of course, internal affairs um, have got to be whiter than white, cleaner than clean, always toe the line. Make some quite boring characters, you know? The Mavericks are who we really want. We want Satan. We don't want Adam and Eve, you know what I mean? Um, and, and so Fox was a little bit grey in the first book, but I worked hard and by book two of the Malcolm Fox series, he was, he was an interesting character and I was on his side. But then I brought Rebus back and I thought, now who wouldn't be happy about Rebus coming back? Oh, Fox, the kind of cop who investigates bent cops. So suddenly he's the antagonist, not the protagonist. And because we're all on Rebus' side, we can't be on Malcolm Fox's side. So then I just thought, right, well, go, let's go for it. Let's make Fox, in some ways, a baddie, in inverted commas. Somebody that we're, we're booing rather than rooting for. And he's always, he's one of these guys who's a born desk jockey, but he wants to be a man of action, and it never goes well for him. Uh, he wants to feel that he's involved, that he's leading things. Um, and really, he'd be best just sitting at Gart Kosh, behind his desk, um, typing on his computer. But he's not, he's not happy just to do that. You mentioned Gart Kosh there, and looking back over the whole series, we've talked, touched a little bit on the way that crime has changed, but the changing in policing 
And keeping up with that kind of structural change that you know, Gark Kosh mm. now exists in the which yeah. has certain stations that were in the early books have been yeah. mothballed or closed down. There's a, a rather kind of melancholy bit with one of the sort of whizzies and just how shabby and run down some of these offices are. Can you talk a bit about how the role of policing and just the kind of fabric of policing has changed? Well, yeah, I mean, I, this is another problem. I, mean, I try and write my books more or less in the real world in real time. So again, you've got to keep up with the changes in Police Scotland and it, all the time. Because, I mean, in this book, there's a kind of almost like a joke, isn't there, where Malcolm Fox, the name of the organisation he works for now, is not what it was called two years ago. Um, it's moved from sort of serious crime division or major crime to, oh, counter, what is it, counter-terrorism and serious crime, I can't remember. I can't remember. All these acronyms and, num and just, you go, who's, I think Reba yeah. says, who the hell's doing this? You know, yeah, somebody's yeah. getting paid to do this. Someone somewhere is getting paid to make up all these nonsense acronyms. Uh, so that all, that all changes. And I, if you'd get it wrong, if you get it even slightly wrong, you're going to get a letter from somebody. You're yeah. going to get a letter from somebody who's going to say, I think you'll find, Mr. Rankin, <laughs> that a year ago they changed serious crimes. It's no longer called that, it's called something else. But I want to put all that in and let you know that I've done my research without boring you to tears. So I try and do it with a light touch. And you don't need a lot. You don't need a lot. I mean, Gart Kosh probably hasn't changed that much since I visited it. I probably visited it five years ago, uh -huh. and I've not been back since. But I can't think it's changed that much. Um, and, and what, I mean, I do check what the um, senior staff wear, so I can get, keep that right. Uh, but it's fiction. I mean, you know, if you go to me, I'm, I think you'll find, I go, this is fiction. I've got to take a few, you know, change a few things so here. So shortcuts. Yeah, I've just got to change a few things to make it dramatic. Or, or that, well, that's my excuse. And as, as we're talking about changing, obviously Edinburgh has been a kind of character in most of the books. How do you, how do you write about the sort of changing Edinburgh and the ways of which <coughs> very built environment, not just the trams, but every time I go to Edinburgh nowadays, which is rarer than it used to be, it feels like a different place. I think, you know, I'll go to that shop, no longer yeah, there. there. I'll go to that yeah. restaurant, no longer there. And What's that thing where the St. James's Centre used to be? Well, yeah. it's the golden turd. Um, <laughs> uh, there's no way we're calling it the walnut whip, which is what they're trying to get us to call it. <laughs> um, the dog turd. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, right. I mean, it, does, it changes. And I, I, do try and, I do try and reflect that as much as possible, with, uh, again, without boring anybody. Um, or you turned left on this street and then a shop. But you know what? I've got th things change. You know, as you say, shops change and, and restaurants change and that. And I go, what did I used to be? And uh -huh. I honestly can't remember yeah. what something was six months ago. I go, I can't remember what that was. It's not a flower shop. What was it before? I've no idea. Um, but the, the previous book, Heart Full of Headstones, I got it in my head that I was going to have it set just, just as we were coming out of COVID and that something was going to happen in Constitution Street in Leith. So I wrote the book uh, and everything. And what I do is I wait until the first draft is done and then I do the research. So, because it's quicker that way. If you do the research first, you might do far too much that you don't really need. So having that, I thought, okay, I need, to go, I need to go to Constitution Street and I need to do this, need to do that. So I, got, I walked down to Constitution Street Blow me, the whole thing was dug up for tram works. <laughs> and I thought, I've got police cars whizzing up and down here. <laughs> yeah. You couldn't physically get a police car or an ambulance in here. So I went, shit, what do I do? Do I change the location? I have to change the whole location of this, this kind of crucial scene in the book. Or do I just have the police cars parked two streets away and have the police complain about the fact that they cannot drive up and down Constitution Street? And that was what I did. So the, there's that kind of stuff I've got to check because it keeps changing all the time. One-way systems change. You can't drive down the bridges or the, one of the, the bridges is one way only. Or, um, and, you know, for most people, most of my readers don't live in Edinburgh. They probably wouldn't, it wouldn't bother them if I didn't put that stuff in. But I quite like putting it in. I yeah, do quite so like it. And, and the Oxford Bar never changes. So no, it and, literally doesn't change. And yet, ironically, although the Oxford Bar never changes, I do still go there quite often for research. <laughs> <laughs> to make sure it hasn't changed. But that's so important because the bond of trust with the reader, the kind of contract you have with the reader, is so easily broken. I remember one novel where somebody got a train from Edinburgh to Peebles, mm -hmm. and <laughs> it wasn't set in 19... 36. <laughs> and somehow that soured the whole novel for me, that I just thought, 
you know, it was a tiny detail. It was yeah, really yeah, yeah. immaterial. But I felt, if you're not willing to check that out, yeah. then I'm not going to trust you on the bigger things. So is that why you have to keep some of these things so neat? Because you're asking us to make the bigger leap into trusting the judgments that these characters are coming to. I think, I mean, I think so. I think, it, you know, you need to think that I know what I'm, up, what I'm talking about, really. Yeah. If, I can, if I can trick you into that, uh, then I've succeeded. Um, you just made me think of something. You know, P.D. James, God bless her, you know, brilliant crime writer, in one of her novels has somebody putting their motorbike into reverse. <laughs> <laughs> I think my favourite one like that is... Virginia Woolf's Between the Acts, where one character comes up with a champagne bottle and says, who's got a corkscrew for this? Oh, nice. I mean, ridiculous. I mean, that's, there's mistakes in every Rebus novel. There's loads of mistakes. I'm all, there's always a mistake that will be flagged up for me six months after publication. Um, uh, you know, I mean, famously, the Oxford bar, I, I put a foot rail in at the front of the bar. It didn't oh, yeah, exist. Yeah. didn't exist. Because I was living in France at the time, and I just was remembering the Oxford bar, and I, a Rebus put his foot up on the foot rail. There was one down the side, but there wasn't one at the front of the bar. And people go, I think you'll find Mr. Rankin. But in the, uh, <laughs> so the previous owner of the Oxford bar, John Gates, no, it wasn't John Gates, was it John Gates? I think it was John Gates, paid for a foot rail to be installed. <laughs> <laughs> so that, just to save my blushes. <laughs> Do you miss Cafferty? Does Rebus um, miss Cafferty? Uh, spoiler for those who haven't got this far in the series yet, but yeah, Cafferty, who was a gangster who ran Edinburgh, no longer exists. Um, Interesting one, that. He was meant to be a very minor character in one book. He was in book three yeah. for one scene. Uh, but he just got under my skin. I thought, there's a lot I can do. But you're the devil tempting Rebus. Or you're, you're, the, you're the kind of Mr. Hyde to his Jekyll or whatever. You're very close to him in your, the way you perceive the world. Uh -huh. But you're very different in many ways. Uh, so he became the kind of tempter, always tempting Rebus to cross the line and not go back. Um, and then, you know, I mean, I was, I was probably halfway, three quarters of the way through the first draft of Heart Full of Headstones, and I suddenly thought, oh, Christ, you're not going to make it. This is the book where you, you don't make it. Uh, and, and that was okay. I just, it rocked me. But the book told me, this is, you know, this is it. Uh -huh. uh, and, um, wow. So I was in two minds about it. In fact, let, no, you know what? I'm misremembering. I, when I presented the book to my agent, Cafferty, <coughs> Cafferty lived. Really? And it was my agent that said Cafferty dies. It was my agent that said Cafferty dies. It wasn't the book, it was my agent. He said, I think this is the moment. And I went, really? And he went, yep. And so I thought about it, and I looked at it, and I thought about it, and I looked at it, and I discussed it with my wife. I went, okay. Isn't that extraordinary? Yes, that is. I mean, it is extraordinary. Um, you've got the power of life and death over these people, which is amazing, isn't it? Uh, but, but yeah, I do I miss him. I do miss him a little bit because whenever Rebus and Cafferty were in a scene, it was explosive. Yeah. It was explosive. There was just two heavyweights in the ring. You know, it was, it was uh, Ali and George Foreman or something. It was phenomenal. Um, but in some ways, that sucked all the oxygen out of the room for other characters. So you completely ignored anybody else in that scene because they were such big characters. So things have, so things have been rejigged now. And maybe it's good that Rebus is in jail in this book because I don't, have to, I, don't, I, I don't miss, there's no vacuum where Cafferty should be. And Daryl is a very different kind of villain. Um. Yeah, yeah, he, he is. I mean, he's, he's, he's drifted into being Mr. Big in a way. He was introduced in uh, the comeback book. He was introduced yeah. in... Um, standing on a man's grave, uh, because his sister had, 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 had disappeared, uh, been murdered, um, and he just became a criminal, um, in some ways tempted by Cafferty. Um, and, uh, and then he decided he had to usurp Cafferty, take him over. Um, and now, although he's in prison, like many gangsters yeah. around the world, he can still control things from his prison cell, thanks to a steady stream of mobile phones. Uh, which somehow mysteriously make their way into prison in all you're, kinds of ways. You're very good on the mobile phones in it. I mean, that's one of the, yeah. the highlights of the specificity. I mean, Rebus says in one bit, he says something like uh, to, 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 to Christy, he said, I need, I need a mobile phone. I know you, sometimes you, uh, people smuggle them in and sometimes they're up their arse and that. 
I prefer one of the former, not one of the latter. <laughs> <if you're laughs> <honest>. yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> one thing I've always admired in the books, and it's a kind of curious thing to sort of pick up on because it's usually used as something that people say is a, a fault, but I really, really don't think it is, is, is bathos. I remember in Exit Music, uh, that bit where Siobhan says, you know, sometimes it's less than meets the eye. Mm. And in this book as well, there's a kind of real streak of, there might be some much, much bigger story out there. And it's, it brings it back down when somebody says, you know what, you're not that important to them. Yeah. You know, you might think you're big fish, actually, you're still minnows. Yeah. And I quite like that. There's something very self-deprecating. Is that a peculiarly Scottish thing to have that sort of coin the feet out for under them? Um, yeah, but also I think it's, it's me um, arguing against the sensationalism that you get in crime fiction. It's very anti-glamour and you've I got really these, admire You've that. got these Rococo serial killers like Hannibal Lecter yeah. who really have, could never exist in real life. Um, although he is a composite of some killers who've, who've been, you know, historically accurate. Very intelligent man. Um, super intelligent um, and, 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 you know, uh, an epicure and all the rest of it. Uh, he likes his fine wines to go with his human bits and bobs. Um, but, you know, it's like crime is, is kind of sordid and it's ordinary and it's, um, it's off the streets and, and it speaks to us of kind of human weakness. Uh, I mean, most crimes are just come back down to the seven deadly sins, yeah. as, as you'll know, because you've read my play. Uh, in fact, you reviewed it, thank you very much. Um, no, not the play, but the, the, the publication of the play. Um, but, you know, there's all that going on. But, the, and we're absolutely fascinated. We are absolutely fascinated by why bad things continue to happen in the world. And but the one, the one thing I would say is that, and again, this comes back to the thing about crime writers not you know writing a certain kind of book at the moment it's not just that these are books of paranoia they're books that don't have cops in them the the kind of novel of the police procedural novel i think yeah. is dying and it's dying because we don't trust the police anymore we don't think they are the good guys we don't think they are the cowboys who are going to come and save us um or the knights in shining armor or even the tarnished knights um we think they're they're corrupt or potentially corrupt we think they are killers and rapists uh, in America, we had Black Lives Matter. Uh, in the UK, we had the Metropolitan Police. We had what happened in Fife with Sheikha Bayou. Yeah. We've had all of these things going on. Um, and here I am, almost like a PR wing of the police in a way, saying, actually, no, the police are doing their best in very difficult circumstances. But a lot of younger writers are going, I'm not interested in that. I don't think I can sell that to a readership. It's very interesting the way in which things like the true crime podcasts have taken off so phenomenally and that there's even a sort of subgenre of the crime that was the true crime podcast mm. and how that actually muddied the waters and led to miscarriages of justice. It's not something that's really tempted you, is it? The true crime Oh, jeez, no. I, you know what? This, this, is a, this is, I mean, uh, this goes back a long way. I once went into a bookshop and uh, the, I was talking to them about the types of people that go into bookshops. And I said, oh, yeah, you know, romance fiction, yeah, lovely people, love them, the crime fiction, lovely people. The ones you've got to watch out for, the ones who go in the true crime section. And they stand there for hours just looking at the photographs. <laughs> you know? And actually the misery memoir ones as well. Yeah. You know, yeah. There's something that, that just got, that got in my head and I thought, right, okay, I'm, true crime, no. Um, I, but, I mean, I do, I do read occasional true crime books, you know, like Tom Wood did a really good one, uh, ex-deputy chief constable of uh, Loading and Borders did a, a really good one about, um, I'm going to forget the name, but it was a famous case where a body was found in a stream in the borders. Um, but Buck Ruxton? Something like that. It was night, early 20th century. And he killed his wife and driven her up from Lancashire or something and dumped her body in a stream in the borders. Um, and the body parts, bits. Uh -huh. um, but they were wrapped up in newspaper. And the newspaper gave the police the, where he, you know, the town he lived in. That's and that good. was the start That's of them unravelling it. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, so uh, true crime, it doesn't really, no, podcast, I'm not going to be doing any podcasts anytime soon if that's what you're asking me. Uh, and, and, you know, writers have to spend so much of their time now not writing. We're supposed to be promoting our books, we're supposed to be doing vlogs and blogs, and we're supposed to be doing this and doing that, and always Are on you social on media. I'm, don't do, I'm not a TikTok man. 
I'll be honest with you. I don't. I don't really get tech talk. I've never even. I've never invested. I mean, I do. I'm on social media far too much actually, and I say it's because um, I'm supposed to be promoting my books, but it's because I like a good gossip. <laughs> and most of my mates are on there, so I can have a gossip with them over thousands of miles. Uh huh. The new TV series is quite interesting in the way it has changed some of the parameters. Uh, it's changed the setting, not mm -hmm. Edinburgh, but the chronological setting. It's changed some of the, the way the characters inter uh, relate. So mm -hmm. Daryl is yeah. is in the in at the outset rather than a figure much later on. And I was thinking about it. I think I've actually said in the review that there's a, a kind of lovely possibility of a rebus verse of lots of different <laughs> versions of rebus. You know, in the same way that you have three different Spider-Man films with yeah, Tobey yeah, Maguire yeah. in one and somebody else in another. I mean. Is that appealing, seeing these characters that are now so archetypal, they can be moved around, that there's only certain things that make Rebus Rebus? And apart from that, you've got the whole of time and space and history to play with. Um, not really. I, I mean, I do get confused. I've always got to think, right, which Rebus am I thinking about at the moment? Is it the Rebus from the TV shows, the Rebus from the play, or the Rebus from the novels? Um, the TV, well, I mean, it's an interesting one, that, because it was the writer Gregory Burke, who's a terrific screenwriter and dramatist. He did Black Watch, yeah. uh, amongst other things. Um, and the two main actors, uh, Rebus and his brother, in the TV, got their first real acting job on Black Watch. So they loved the idea of working with Gregory Burke again. So Gregory was, was, was brought into the project, and he said, he said several interesting things. He said, I want Rebus to be young and macho, so he can get in a fight, and he can do this, and he can do that. But I want to set it in the present day because there are present day social and political issues I want to deal with. And I went, go for it. I said, go for it. Let's see what, it, let's see what the scripts look like. And let's see. I said, but fans will find it really hard for at least the first 10, 15, 20 minutes. They'll get used to it eventually, but they will find it difficult. But the, the pieces are in there. Rebus's ex-wife, his daughter, Siobhan is in there, Malcolm Fox is in there, Catherine is in there. Um, but the, the really interesting thing that, that Greg said to me was, he said, you threw away Rebus's brother, Michael, too cheaply. He said, you got rid of him. You know, after four or five books, he's gone. Um, and he said, there was so much more you could have done with their relationship. And I thought, he's right. He's right. You know, with the benefit of hindsight, I, would, I should have stuck with him. Um, so he conceived it as being these two brothers who, who can uh, love and hate each other uh -huh. and might end up destroying or saving each other. And that's the kind of backbone of the, of the, 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 the plot. And he conceived it as two seasons. And so far, we've only had season one, which is why it ends in a cliffhanger. And we just need to get the funding there for season two. Uh, and let's see if that happens or not. I thought Richard Rankin was phenomenal. It's not his real name, by the way. The actor Richard Rankin, who plays Rebus, his real name is Richard Harris, which is why he changed it. Um, I'm guessing Rankin's maybe his mum's maiden name or something. Um, but I just thought he was absolutely charismatic. I couldn't take my eyes off him. But I did think it was awfully violent. I mean, much more violent than the books and much more violent than I like. My, my wife and I were watching it through our fingers like that. And also, what a potty mouth. What a potty mouth um, Gregory Burke has on him. Uh, and I thought, so season two, I think we'll see, we'll be less swearing. Uh, You've and, not and wagged a finger at him, have you? I, I'm, I, I will, I, as executive, I, you know, I have, I have complete control and authority over this because I'm the executive producer. I'll tell you very quickly how, how powerful the executive producer is. He said, do you want a cameo? I went, yeah. I was in one of the John Hannas, I was in one of the Ken Stotts. He said, let's have a wee cameo. All right, we're filming at the Oxford Bar, perfect. Um, Catherine is leaving the bar, you can be walking in, just a punter walking in, you open the door for him, let him out, you go in, great. Just with your normal clothes in, come down, we're filming, right. Get to the Oxford Bar, all the vans are there, the cameras are set up and a bit ding outside. Uh, and so I just go in, go in, make yourself comfortable. So I go in, get myself a pint, I've got my paper, I've got a book to read, I go to the back room, in the back room all the extras are sitting, waiting. I'm like, all right, sit down, start reading, I'm checking my phone, doing this, doing that, time passes. Second pint, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> time is passing. And I, and I look up and, I, you know, a few of the uh, actors have drifted away, the, the extras aren't there anymore, and I look up again, oh, all the extras are now gone. Um, I'm the only person left in the back room. I, I, I go into the front room, and the barman's there cleaning glasses. And I said, where are they? He said, oh, they've wrapped for the day. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, what? And I looked outside, no vans. And, and I, so I walked home, and I, I phoned Gregory Burke, and he said, oh, they must have forgotten about you. <laughs> Executive producer. 
Never did get my cameo. I, I'm sure there will be time for that in season two, but I think on that point, I'd like to open up to the audience. If you want to stick your hand up, and I know it's always difficult being the first one, but somebody has to be, somebody has very eagerly gone there. Have you memorised your own books? <laughs> In which novel does that line yeah, come? Uh, absolutely not. I've not got a Scooby. I mean, <laughs> I can I can barely remember what I wrote last week. Never mind that. Are they, I, I get I get asked that a lot. Of people will say, "Oh, you know, in, in chapter four of the third book, I'll go, no, just let me stop you there. I don't remember. <laughs> Which what happened in the third book? I've got no idea. Um, no, I've got no idea. I've got, but it sounds. You know what? It's it, it's overwritten." Which makes me think it's an early book. But Cafferty doesn't really enter this series until halfway through. So yeah. it must be one of the, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe the internet can help. Maybe the internet can Google help. Books, Google yeah. Books Advanced Search is quite good for that kind Google of thing. Google Books Advanced Search. No, but, uh, cheating. Read the whole lot till I find it. <laughs> well, I'm, oh. yeah, when you find it, let me know. <laughs> uh, but I promise never to use it again. Um, <laughs> Somebody pointed out to me, another one of these q and I did a long time ago, someone said, Mr. Rankin, um, I notice that in every one of your books, there's always a red car. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's always a trestle table. <laughs> and since when, there's never been a red car or a trestle table in any of my books. <laughs> Let's take another question from the floor. Oh, there's over here, then we'll come back here. Keep her on her toes. Keep her active. Uh, good evening, Stephen. Thank you very much for such a funny and always very full of voices. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued about um, the choice of actors for your characters. Um, do you have any say at all in who they will be? Uh, I think everybody in the Green Company has a different idea of what people will be for Swiss tonight. Um, for me, uh, John Tanner was a bit too pretty, and Ken Scott was, well, not quite so much. Um, I think the young fellow that you've got ranking um, is, is very good for, for young readers. Uh, I just wonder, what do you have in your head? Um, and which is, wh who would be the ideal actor to play the part? Okay. Um, I don't really know what Rebus looks like. I, I very seldom describe him physically in the books. I'm inside his head looking out, usually, or I'm looking over his shoulder from just behind him. Um, another characters sometimes do describe them, but just very vaguely. Uh, because I want you to put your own impressions in there and you to create him um, in your image. Uh, but um, during lockdown, I was asked by the National Theatre of Scotland to do a little, a little playlet that could be done online, that could be streamed online, basically to give act, act, work to actors and, and staff and directors and everything else. And I said, that's great, because I'm getting asked a lot on social media, how would Rebus cope with lockdown? So I wrote a, kind of just a 10 minute monologue for Rebus, telling us how he is coping with lockdown. And they got um, Brian Cox to do it. Not the astrophysicist, <laughs> um, but the, the actor, uh, who was in Upper State New York at the time, uh, waiting to do Succession, his TV show. And so it was all done. I was in Edinburgh watching him on Zoom, and he was in America, and the director was in Glasgow, and, uh, and he'd had the script sent to him. But he, there was no scenery and, or costumes or that. It was just him in a cabin um, in, in somewhere in New York State. But he dressed the set as much as possible. It was his kitchen, and he tried to make it look like an Edinburgh tenement. He put a map of Edinburgh up on the wall, and he had tins of dog food for Brillo, even though he's not got a dog, and uh, a bottle of whiskey over here. And he was brilliant. He was brilliant doing the older Rebus. And it reminded me that way back in the early days when the Rebus was first written, the first book or maybe the second book was out, the BBC were really interested in turning it into a TV show for a while. Um, and I, I said I would love Brian Cox to be given the, the chance to do Rebus. But he was very busy in Hollywood. There was no chance we could have got him. 
So finally, now almost 40 years on, I got my man. I got the guy I originally conceived might be Rebus, perceived might be Rebus, but I got him as a, as a much older actor. In a way, it has a strength that you don't automatically associate it with, some, with a, an individual. I mean, the later Colin Dexter books, it was very much John Thaw yeah, that you were yeah, seeing yeah. now. Although the flip side of that is I've just reviewed uh, Nick Harkaway's book, mm. which is written uh, as his father, well, his father was John Carey, And you read it and, of course, Alec Guinness is smiley. You can forget about the later film. It's, it's completely that era and done, you know, as an active impersonation, astonishingly well. Yeah, I liked that book. I mean, if you're a big fan of, of Smiley Lacari, then this book is a, a really good um, addition to the series. Um, yeah, I mean, I did ask um, Colin Dexter once um, about when Rebus was going to be televised, when the BBC showed interest, I got in touch with Colin Dexter and I said, look, what was it like with, with Morse? And he said, well, I completely changed the way I wrote about the character, yeah. so he was much more like John Thaw. Because yeah. he was so seduced by the performance. And I thought, I don't want that to happen. Yeah. I don't want that to happen, which is why I never watched the early incarnations of Rebus on TV. I've never watched a John Hanna or a Ken Stott. I didn't want them... Infiltrating. ...getting in, in my head yeah. and me starting to write about them and not about my guy. Just over here. I mean, there, yeah, there is music available to you in your, in your cell. Um, I don't really mention it. Uh, it's not really part of the book. I couldn't find a way to bring it in. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's got it in his head, hasn't he? He's got, all, he's got the greatest tunes in the world. They're all inside his head, and he's probably replaying them in his head over and over again. Um, but you can listen to music. They've got flat-screen TVs with DVD player, and the little DVD slots. Um, there's loads of books you can get. You can borrow stuff from the, the, the prison library. Um, he probably does have access to music. He probably does. What but he does hear sound-wise is the bells. Yeah, he hears church bells. Which is done bells. very kind of gothically, whether they're actually chiming or not. Well, let me let, me, let, me let you in a, a top secret, a trade secret here. The book was originally called Hearing... No, sorry. It was either Hearing the Church Bells Drown or When the Church Bells Drown. I can't remember which of those it was. And I, I, I said to my publisher, the book is going to be called Hearing the Church Bells Drown. And they said, no. it's too long. We could get it on the front of the book, but there won't be room for your name. <laughs> Hang on, standing in an old man's grave is Not long. as long, I checked. <laughs> it, I mean, it is, it is the longest of my title. It would have been the longest of my titles by a long chalk. And so I said, OK, all right. So then the hard work began of trying to find what this book was going to be called. And I happened upon Midnight in Blue I liked it because it's got echoes of black and blue, uh -huh. which is probably still my favorite Rebus book. Um, midnight blue, midnight around midnight, it's got a kind of jazz thing going on, blues mm -hmm. and jazz. Um, and I just thought, okay, I like all that. Uh, and of course, the death happens during the night. Um, so we went with that instead. But yeah, the, so the bells, and I thought, well, as a, as a homage to my lost title, I'm gonna make sure the bells are still in there. And the reason the book was going to be called that was because of the references. The wizard, yeah. one of the prisoners, the wizard, keeps hearing these church bells um, when there is no church nearby yes. for him to hear. And it's basically hope. It's what I think it is. I think it's hope. It's the fact there's an outside world out there um, waiting for you. That's very interesting because I read it completely differently. What did you read it as? Well, for whom the bell tolls. Ah. It tolls for thee. Oh, yeah. Because so, there is a kind of increasing sense that, you know, he's 70 now, uh -huh. he's in a prison with a lot of people that don't like him, and it did keep me thinking, the day will come. The day, the day might well come, but as you've just alluded to with the Le Carre book, I mean, I might shuffle off this mortal coil, but John Rebus won't. I mean, if people still want to read Rebus novels, there will be people around to write Rebus novels. In fact, they won't even be people. They will be AI. <laughs> we'll be getting AI, John I don't Rebus. Know. I mean, they're it, just around the corner. I mean, honestly. AI is very good at doing scientific proteins. I'm yet to see <laughs> do a convincing novel. My, my, wife, convincing. my wife's in a book group in Edinburgh, and um, uh, the woman, uh, uh, um, Ellie Up, Eleanor Updale, who's a writer herself, she runs a book group. And Ellie said to Miranda, oh, I've just done a chat GBT. I said to it, do an Ian Rankin story. 
Uh, and she handed me this bit of paper. My wife handed me this bit of paper. It was fucking terrible. <laughs> it was, I mean, it really was. And I'm going, this, this, this machine, machine has never been to Edinburgh. This machine doesn't know the rhythms of Scottish speech. This machine doesn't know how my characters think or what's going on inside their heads. But give it six months or a year, once it's scraped enough information from other people's books and my books, it'll do a much better job. Friends and I did think it was very fun at first seeing what we could do, how much you could confuse it until it was pointed out, you're actually teaching it the whole yeah. time. So just lay off all the sort of fun and games with this. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, coming back to bite you if you're not careful. Yep. We'll squeeze in another question. Da -da -da -da. No, I no, can't no, believe that. No, no, I've well, got to go home. <laughs> is, is the chippy still open? Are you oh, pointing to somebody? Sorry. Yep, sure. Is the chippy still open? <laughs> it's just up the hill. Yeah, but what time is it shut? Well, well, it'll still be open. I'll just tell you the quote. Let's put that crap in the house. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear it. Where's it? Oh, standing on a man's grave. Oh, that's quite a late one then. That's a late one. So that was a Rebus comeback book. How the hell did you do that? They were sudden dark tunnels. Sudden dark tunnels. Yeah. Cafferty's eyes were sudden dark tunnels. Is that satisfactory? <laughs> Is that the quote that you remember? <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Please do. That's extraordinary. See, yeah. computers are amazing. Your phone is a computer. You'll just have to put black holes into every subsequent novel <laughs> to confuse the game now. Yeah, really. I know. <laughs> I might have to. I might, I might start putting trestle tables back in. <laughs> a black hole and a red car. Do you know, do you know why I mention trestle tables in every book? Because every Rebus novel has been written on a trestle table. Oh. Uh, when I got married, we moved to Tottenham in London, and uh, we had no money, and we went to decorate our flat. Where, and we went to I don't know some shop on Tottenham Court Road, and it's like a painter's, like a painter's trestle table. So it's just you know legs that you can sort of fold them flat if you want, and then this big piece of wood that goes on top. Um, and so I had it in London, uh, then it went to France with us, then it came back to Edinburgh with us, and every house we've lived in in Edinburgh, that table is where I write the books. So I'm guessing that subconsciously that's why I write, I mentioned trestle tables. Possibly the most important thing I've ever bought in my life. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Okay, to finish off then, do you think Rebus will ever meet the chief from Scott Squad? <laughs> well, I have worked with the chief from Scott Squad. Uh -huh. I was in one episode. In fact, I was in, a, I was in one episode plus one of the wee squibs that he did as a, as a little side project. Um, he the chief decides he wants to write a, 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 a children's book <laughs> about a wee Scotty dog that's actually a police officer. And he shows me it, uh, and I'm going, and the thing is genuine, I thought, that's actually quite good. Um, <laughs> but in the main episode, I, I, I was at a police awards dinner, and he had a manuscript of an adult novel he'd written, and I was just going to assist, and it was terrible. It was genuinely terrible. It was good fun, though. It's, none of it's scripted. I mean, almost none of that show is scripted. Um, they, just, they just riff on stuff and come up with stuff. Um, and I do think he's an amazing character. You know that one? You, you must have seen the one where he's having to apologise. Yes. Uh, I'd like to apologise. It's like two bald men fighting over a comb. I would like to apologise to the bald community. Of which of, I am. Of member. which I'm a member. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ian, it's a super book. They are increasingly sort of, they're complicated in a very subtle way because you read them and they're so smoothly done. It's only after you think, actually, that was deeper and deeper and deeper and darker. And in, in a lot, a lot of ways sadder than I thought. Mm. Uh, it's a tremendous book. Please come and buy it. If you did have a question but were too shy to ask, I'm sure Ian will speak to you at the end. Please join me in thanking Ian Rankin. Thank you. Thank you very